are currently on hold for state delegates town hall video conference. You'll hear silence until the host joins the call. Please stand by. Good morning, this is Teal. I'll be the operator assisting you today. Quick call operator, are you there? Hi, this is Kayla. Can you hear me? Operator, can you hear me? Yes, operator. Thank you very much. Of course. We'll begin shortly. via um, video, and I don't know if I'm standing here if my back is to them or, <laughs> or what I'm trying to stand over here. Um, so we had a little connection issues, and so we're now ready to get started. Um, I am Tony Clark. I'm a judge in uh, Prince George's County, Maryland, right next to Washington, D.C. 
and I, I'm chair for about another day, give or take. Um, it has been my pleasure to be the chair this year of this conference, a very dynamic conference. Um, and um, I want to just, uh, in particular those folks on the West Coast, because I guess it's what, about 4 o'clock at home, so I'm really happy to see you guys here. Um, I'm going to ask the, the officers just to stand and just introduce themselves and just tell folks where, where you uh, work. Carpenter is the immediate past chair. Um, I also just so just so people for recognition purposes, I would like to ask the any members of the executive committee who are here just stand so everyone can see who's on the executive committee. I know quite a few of you here. Okay. And um, those committee chairs uh, and vice chairs, please just stand so that folks can see who you are. And liaisons, we have uh, uh, several liaisons who are liaisons to other entities within the ABA. Thank you. And delegates, delegates who are here. It should be everybody. I just want, I mean, you know, it's a business meeting, so there may, not, there may be some members who are not delegates who are here, but so welcome. Um, and we're going to actually later on uh, have each of the delegates stand and, and tell us a little bit about yourselves. Um, we, the next item on the agenda is the uh, minutes, um, um, and I hope that everyone. Oh, okay. Who, who do we have? I don't know. Where, which way do I look? All right. All right. mention this is available to us by court call one of our fine and loyal sponsors and JC Welsh is uh, the person who knows how to do all this stuff <laughs> and we thank them for uh, their uh, constant support uh, minutes everybody had an opportunity to review the minutes any discussion any revisions, any amendments, anything? All right, all in favor? All right, chair's report um, is the next item, and that is really uh, my opportunity to just tell you all what we've been doing here in particular. Um, we started Wednesday with an outreach at the YMCA, which was fabulous. We had about 120 students and uh, about, um, just about 30 judges, and uh, we did a civics and the law uh, type presentation um, and, and discussed with them uh, issues uh, and we gave them scenarios and we discussed them, those facts as it relates to the U.S. Constitution and the amendments and it was a very lively discussion. The students were fantastic. Um, Wednesday evening we uh, had a chat, a uh, fireside chat with um, Justice Hines, thank you, um, and that was, that was fabulous. She told us about her journey. Um, and uh, we, we invited the minority and specialty bar associations in the area to come join us for that. Um, and that was at the historic courthouse um, in Boston. It was it's John Adams Courthouse. It was, I'm looking at Marcella because she has all these names in her head. Um, and and it, was, it was really a beautiful, absolutely beautiful courthouse and a great venue. Um, yesterday we had a fabulous program on uh, implicit bias, which was the, the first of the series of um, programs, and I want to thank Annette for all of her hard work in making that happen because um, um, we had some, some last minute tap dancing we had to do, and so it really was a very fabulous program, and uh, I want to thank um, Judge Donald, I know she's not here this morning, but she did a fantastic job. Um, the, the, re the remaining um, CLE in the series will be um, one this, later on this morning. And then the other one is scheduled for this after, late this afternoon, 
it's on the, um, the, the schedule that you received. Um, in between, the um, appellate judges are celebrating their 50th anniversary, and so they're having a luncheon, um, and we have two tables, so hopefully you have signed up and are, are going to join us. Um, and, and after that, they're going to have a, a tribute program. So um, we have a full day today, um, and then um, we have our, our meeting tomorrow morning. Um, what, what will happen tomorrow, whatever we don't get done today, we will uh, pick up where we left off and then finish the agenda um, tomorrow morning. And unfortunately, yes, we are scheduled to start at 7.30 tomorrow morning. Um, <laughs> um, and so that's really um, uh, all I have to report. I mean, there, in the newsletters that you've received, I've sort of outlined things that we've been doing during the year. Um, and so hopefully you've had an opportunity to, to, to look at that. And um, I mean, our members are all over the place doing fantastic things. And if I started going through the list now, we would not get this meeting done. But um, uh, we, it, it's, it's in the newsletter, and hopefully you've had an opportunity, the journal, hopefully you've had an opportunity to, to look at that. Um, and I think that's all I have to report at this point. Um, is anyone here from Justice at Stake? Yes? No? Not yet. Okay. Um, I, one, one thing that um, we, we have been able to do is, is um, we, we have group membership. Um, we have a, a group membership, and I think I've, I've written about that in, um, in emails and in, in the journal, um, um, the president's co the chair's column. Um, and so let me just explain, there's two ways to really um, maximize your dollar and be a member of this conference as well as another conference. Um, one is a group dues, uh, a group dues program, membership program. That is if you get uh, five or more judges from your jurisdiction or from your group, however you want to define your group, with at least 50% of them being new members of the, of the ABA and the Judicial Division, then you can have a group dues rate. Um, and it, last year it was uh, with the ABA um, membership and the JD or the conference membership, it was $105. I think that's going up next year, but not by a lot. Um, and so you can be a member, your group, you have to have one person or one entity, however you want to do it, but one point person to, to be the group administrator um, so that when the invoices come out, they will come to that person and that person then will be responsible for making sure that everybody's checks get collected, however you do that and getting it all sent in. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity to really be a, a member um, and at a very reduced uh, um, dues rate. The other thing that we have is joint uh, membership, and that is we have um, 11, it, it was 11 or 12 entities, it's 15 now, um, and I think I put that list in, it's, you can go on the, on the internet and get the list, but I, I put that list in, the, um, in my article as well. Um, you can be a member of, of our conference and one of those other entities for $60. So you pay your, and if you're in a group, it's wonderful because <laughs> you, you get the group rate, then you join two, if you join two, it's $60. So you could be a member of JD and a member, you have to be a member of JD in order to, to get the benefit of the um, joint membership. But we, uh, off the top of my head, I know we have tips, we have family, litigation, criminal. I mean, you know, if you have, if you have a, a, an interest or if in your prior life, you know, you, you had a fo focus on a certain area of the law and you want to participate um, as in, with one of these entities, it's a great opportunity um, and it's really a great reduced rate. So if you have the group membership, um, at, join the ABA with the group, two entities, $60, so that's the, the ABA dues plus the $60, great savings. It's, it was 135 last year and I'm with, the, with it going up, it's, I think it's like another 25 to the, 155. So it's a great deal. Um, it's a great opportunity to, to really uh, get active and be a member of ABA, our conference, 
and maybe another entity if you have a particular interest in what they do. So, and the reason I wanted to explain that to you is because we do have, um, uh, we've invited some members from some of the other entities to come and join us and it, just tell you all what they do. And so we do have um, someone from Family Law Section. Is, is it Kendra? If you want to... Jolivet. Good morning, Your Honor. All right. And thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I am Kendra Randall Jolivet, law firm of Randall and Sonier. That's my law partner hanging out, handing out some materials to you today, Yolanda Sonier. We have a law firm in Baltimore, Maryland. I am co-chair of the Member Benefits Development Committee for the Family Law Section of the ABA and we are here seeking your joint membership in our section. How many of you would love to have a conference in Bermuda? Can you show your hands for me? Okay, well, if you were a member of the family law section, you would have attended Bermuda two months ago. That's where we were. I'm sorry you missed it. It really was a great conference, great location and everything. But the good news for you is that we do have great locations on board. We're going to be in Stow, Vermont in October. We're going to be in California next May. So we do have some great locations. That's one thing. Um, another thing I want you to know, if you look at your pamphlets, it tells you a lot of highlights of our section, how many members we have, the different committees we have, that I'm sure at least one of them would interest you, and we'd love to have your participation. Uh, another point I'd like to make to you is that in addition to being a co-chair of member benefits, I was also the chair for four years of the Courts Dealing with Families Committee. And in that capacity, I can tell you that we need you judges. There are so many new developments. We as practicing attorneys have different clients who are relying on the internet. And when they come in, it's a different person. And so we need you to explain to us your perspective and we need to explain to you our perspective. We also need you on the different committees with all the different new uh, legislation and appellate opinions and you know all the different developments that are going on in family law. We need your perspective in the family law section. And you can participate in different committees. Um, my committee, which was the courts dealing with families, alternative families, and a number of other committees where we could really use your input. We also have great publications in the Family Law section, the Family Advocate and the Family Law Quarterly, and we also have a number of books that are published. So if there's a particular issue that's important to you, then you can express it in the Family Law section. So we would love, love, love to have you there. So as I close, I say please join the Family Law section for you, for us, and for the family. Thank you very much. All right, and uh, one of our other partners is uh, the criminal justice section, and I see, I think we have all three uh, members. We have uh, Sydney Butcher, uh, Steve Salzberg, and Cynthia Orr. Just a point of privilege about, uh, while they come up, about Sydney. Um, in Maryland, we have a leadership academy. Uh, the, the Maryland State Bar Association has a leadership academy, and um, we, uh, every year, we take about, um, uh, 15 to 20 fellows, and we, we have a course that they take, a year-long course, um, and basically teach them how to be bar leaders. I was chair of that committee, and Sydney was one of my, our fellows, so I'm proud to see him now really active in the, in the ABA, and it's always a pleasure to see him. We actually have Sydney, Judy Friedman, who's in the back there. Um, Cynthia Orr is one of our co-chair elect, but she's not here. So, I'll be brief. If you want to go to Bermuda, join Family Law. We don't go to Bermuda. Um, that's not why I'm here. Uh, if you take a look over the last decade, 15 years, at the entity that's provided more policy for the ABA and the House delegates, it's the Criminal Justice Act. All you got to do is take a look at the summary of resolutions, midwinter meeting, annual meeting. In fact, this is our quietest meeting for a long time. Um, we take enormous pride in the fact that 
when you look at criminal justice, and many of you do, you know, there are all these organizations out there that talk to each other. There's the National District Attorneys Association. Well, former president of that, Matt Hatt, is the current chair of criminal justice. We have the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. The immediate past president is Cynthia Orr, who is our co-chair elect. The um, chair after our next co-chairs is going to be Bernice Donald. We are a section that brings together prosecutors. Sidney's a prosecutor in Maryland, and he's one of the young people that we're most proud of. You know, he's going to take over for me and for Neil Sonnet when they finally push us aside as they're trying to do everything gently. Um, we bring together prosecutor Judy Friedman, Department of Justice, defense lawyers, the next two chairs, Cynthia Orr, Jim Feldman is a defense lawyer from Tampa, and judges. And when we come up with policy, it's policy that represents the judgment across the board in the criminal justice system. It's judges, academics, prosecutors, and defense lawyers. And some of you will recognize that back in 2004, it's actually 10 years to the month. In fact, tomorrow it will be 10 years to the day that the House of Delegates voted on the recommendations of the ABA Justice Kennedy Commission, which I chaired. If you go back and look at those recommendations, they called for criminal justice reform that no one thought would happen, that no one, that people thought we were dreaming. Well, you look at the recommendations, and they're being adopted nationwide now. There has been a sea change in what's going on in criminal justice. And a big reason for that is the various constituents have all reached agreement that certain things don't make sense anymore, like measuring success in criminal justice by how many people you can lock up. We've changed that. We've tried to be smarter, more effective, and more efficient. And that's because what we realize, and I think you judges know it, whether it comes to judicial salaries, judicial independence, if we get the prosecutors who are elected on board, we get political clout behind reforms that academics can't get along, defense lawyers can't get along, but together we have legislative power, and we use that power, and we've used it effectively. And we want judges to participate more with us. Often at the annual meeting, some of you are looking around the room know, we negotiate with judges about, about resolutions, often because we have too few judges who are actually active in criminal justice, and we want more. I mean, criminal justice system in the United States represents our ideal of what it ought to be. We used to say we're the model for the world. We'd like to continue to believe that. In order to believe that, we want buy-in from everybody. We want buy-in from every part of the system. We want judges involved. Um, we want you part of us. We want to be supporting you, and in return, we hope you'll work with us and become part of our section. And Sydney, from the Young Lawyers perspective, before we're done, I'm going to turn this over to you, and you should inspire them, because you'll be here years after me, and we want them to remain part of the criminal justice section. You always put a lot of pressure on you. Uh, I am co-chair um, with Judy for membership, and uh, Professor Salzberg has really echoed or, or said a lot of the things on why it's important to have uh, the judiciary at the table. One of the things that was inspiring, one of the reasons I wanted to really get involved with the criminal justice section is because on that section council, as Professor Salzberg talked about, you have members from the defense, from the prosecution, and not just the prosecution, you have elected officials from across the country, uh, whether it's a small town and um, in some states or some of the bigger jurisdictions like in New York, uh, you have representatives that have been elected um, by their community. In addition to that, we also have representatives that are the federal uh, public defender from, from in the District of Columbia. And it's really interesting from a young lawyer's perspective to see all this wealth of knowledge that's at this table where people are debating and talking about different resolutions. It helps me as a prosecutor it's also encouraged me to try to get not other, just other young lawyers involved, but also to try to take more leadership roles. They've been very accommodating, very encouraging for us to get involved. And what is missing is that we still need more judges to participate. And it would be a great opportunity. It's 60 bucks to join the criminal justice section and the judicial uh, division. The, the dues are split evenly between both of the, the sections in the end of the division. And, um, a lot of judges in here. So getting active with the criminal justice section would also allow you an opportunity to not only get uh, those 
leadership opportunities, but to also learn and take things away. I know that one of the groups that you have speaking with you this morning is Justice of State. And we work with organizations like that, like the very Institute. So we're learning about implicit bias. And those all those types of issues help everyone when you're dealing with matters in the world. So Judge Clark, thank you so much for the opportunity. We hope that you get some serious consideration for the morning. All right, let me just ask this question. <clears throat> How many of you are really active in the ABA and understand how, I think they understand how it works, because I don't know that I fully understand, but do you understand the, the, the entities and how the ABA works and where we fall in that? Does anybody, does anybody have any questions about that or want me to explain it a little bit? Okay, all right. Very, very briefly, because we want to get into the next stage of the meeting. Um, the ABA has what I always say a bazillion entities, and I call them entities because some of them are called divisions, some of them are called conferences, um, sections, so I always just say entities, and there are a lot of them. We've, we've only heard from two of them. We have a, a joint uh, membership arrangement with 14 of them. Um, the judicial division is one of the divisions, one of the entities that is in the ABA. Within the Judicial Division, there are six conferences. Uh, the Conference of State Trial Judges, which is our conference, Conference of Specialized Court Judges, uh, comp the Appellate uh, Judges Conference, uh, the Administrative Law Judges Conference, the Lawyers Conference, did I miss one? Federal, oh, please, uh, yeah, I'll go on this the Federal Judges Conference. And so um, each conference has the leadership um, like we have here, pretty much each conference is set up the same way. And so um, the Judicial Division, there's a House of Delegates, uh, which is like the uh, legislature, and then there's the Board of Governors, which is really the governing body of the ABA. Um, and the Judicial Division has uh, a seat at, at those t tables as well. And so it, 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 that's sort of the shortcut version. Um, there's a lot of stuff that goes on and, and resolutions get passed and get submitted by any entity that has an interest in whatever the topic is. Um, and the, the House of Delegates ultimately votes on the resolution. Um, and it, it's, there's, there's, a, there's a process for that as well. Um, Bill Carpenter is going to be, he, he's going to take over after well, we're going we're to vote on that, but it is anticipated. <laughs> Let's put it this way. Let me go back. Let me back up. Herb, Herb Dixon is our member of the House of Delegates right now, and he's at another meeting, so that's why he is not here today. Um, and so, in a nutshell, that's how it's set up. And, and that's why we thought it was important for you to meet some of the, the leadership of some of these other entities uh, with which we are partners. Um, we also um, honored to have the um, chair of the judicial division here with us, uh, Justice Mark Martin. He he's going to say a few words, but he's he's going to wait till his, his chair elect gets here. So, um, but I did want to thank him for coming and joining us. Um, so I think we're we're I'm going to I'm going to jump ahead a little bit because we do have the chair of our uh, membership committee here today, and she may not be here uh, be available tomorrow. So I'm going to let her give her report. And then we're going to move into the delegate portion uh, of the meeting. Leslie Mills. Good morning. So we've, we've actually done an outstanding job with membership this year, and that's in great part to our group membership program and the opportunities that you all have taken to develop your groups and grow our membership. I do want to stress, though, a little bit about the joint dues program. We were really fortunate to do this. It was a long battle, um, frankly, to get the membership committee to agree and approve our joint dues program. And we had to work a little bit to ensure that all other sections and divisions realized the importance of this and came into the program with us. So we have 15 sections and divisions who have agreed to participate. Some of these sections charge 60 or $65 for dues for that membership alone. So they're taking a significant reduction in their membership dues 
to have judges because they believe it is so important to have more judges involved in their section or division. And when you heard Steve talk about criminal justice, they do um, produce a lot of resolutions in the House of Delegates. When he talks about our collaboration, we've had some issues in the past where we've said, from a judicial point of view, there are some things, unintended consequences of the resolutions you've proposed. And we haven't had an opportunity to discuss these with you. Um, and they've withdrawn them and we've worked things out and we've gone forward and, and they passed in the House um, subsequent to that. But it would certainly be beneficial if we had judges actively involved in the section when those resolutions are being um, created, when they're being developed. I know with so many of these sections, they are very anxious to have judges actively involved. There'll be opportunities to be on panels for those of you who like to speak, opportunities to publish, so if you like to write. They all have publications, um, and they're very, very anxious. They joined this program at a, um, at this reduced fee to them, the judicial division loses $5 from the dues, but they're losing anywhere from $20 to $40 to have us participate in their section. And they determined that it's worth it to them to do that. So I really encourage you to look at the list um, for just $25 more than you're being part of this section alone. You can join the joint dues program. and. If you have an interest in, there's dispute resolution, many of you are probably thinking about that as a, uh, as a later life choice. So um, there are a lot of opportunities to be involved with these sections, learn a great deal, but most importantly, um, share the judicial perspective with those in these divisions and take advantage of uh, opportunities within them. So, um, membership has been, membership has been falling throughout the ABA for a number of reasons. Um, certainly the dues increase um, is not advantageous to us and helpful in increasing um, membership. But over the years, I think everybody knows that people don't join the way they used to. They're not joining organizations for the good of the order, for the betterment of the profession. And um, it, it's, people's lives are very hectic and groups um, membership, organizational membership has been falling across the country, which is not just among lawyers, but among all professional organizations. So it really is, um, we need to do more to ensure that people understand what we do in this um, association, how the benefits of it. We're going to, we've developed um, some talking points, and we're going to be looking at those in our membership committee meeting today and then we'll be able to distribute those. Once those are um, finalized, um, we'll be able to distribute those to all of you so that you can see not only what the Judicial Division has done, the National Conference of State Trial Judges, but also the ABA, and how the ABA has done a tremendous amount for the justice system, for lawyers, for the profession, and the importance of joining. And um, frankly, with our reduced rate with group dues, um, it's kind of a no-brainer, but um, so for, for $95 to join the ABA is an incredible bargain. Um, I know that I approach people in my court and say, will you ever remember the ABA and why did you, why did you um, stop your membership? And to the person, it was the amount of money. And I said, well, you can join our group dues. How would you feel if it was $95? And they go, incredible. So, I now have um, 23 members of my court involved in uh, join, who have joined the ABA, and we used to have three when this all started. So if, if I can do it in my court, I'm sure you can do it in your court as well. Um, we have a lot of information. I'm always available. Linda, is, um, Linda and I are going to be co-chairs next year and we're always available to help you and give you information about how to work through this process. The joint dues is a little difficult this year because with the change to the computer system personify that the ABA went to this year, it's been a somewhat of a disaster. It was supposed to roll out last fall. 
because it's rolled out this spring and there have been a lot of glitches. We've kind of lost out in, in that with our joint dues program, so we can't do that online this year. But it's going to, you have to be able, you have to do it with a phone call. But if you're willing to navigate the process a little, it is doable. Again, if you have any questions, I'm always available to answer those for you. Joanne Seringer um, is a staff person who's very, very helpful and always happy to answer your questions as well. I just want to congratulate everyone. Tony's looking at me because we got to move on. But oh, I, that's what I was going to do. I was going to tell you, share the good news with you. This last year, the judicial division had um, a, a challenge to all the conferences, and the conference there were two prizes. One prize to those who got the greatest percentage increase in membership. Since we're the largest conference, it's kind of hard for us to win the greatest percentage membership because we would have uh, needed, well, the group that won that only had 280 members. So they were able to have a 17% increase. They really worked hard, and um, that was the administrative law judges. They did a great job, but they won that award. However, there was also an award for the most new members um, brought into the judicial division and through the hard work of everybody in this room and many others who are here the National Conference of State Trial Judges is winning that award and so at the at the judicial um, division council meeting Tony will be awarded a check for $250 that will go to our conference no to the conference and um, so we want to, we're not going to have that contest next year, but um, as, you know, and, and I didn't even promote the fact that there was a conference when I sent all my um, encouraging messages to everybody all year long about, about working hard to do this, but um, because everybody did work so hard, we did, we did win that. And um, I hope that we can continue to increase our membership, and a lot of the issue is not only increasing bringing in new members, but also retaining those who are presently members. So um, it's up to all of us. We're here. We understand what the conference does. We tend to have a little more um, knowledge about what's going on within the conference. And I hope you share that with all your colleagues at home. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Leslie, for all your hard work over all of these years. Um, one thing that you might want to do in terms of getting your group together. If you have some judges on your bench or in your jurisdiction who are already members of other entities of the ABA and have not joined the judicial division, in particular the ones that we have a partnership with, go talk to them and say, you know, you could pay a lot less for your dues <laughs> if you join this group, if we put together this group, and then they can still be a participant and very active in their, the entity that they're already active in, but they're going to pay a lot less in dues. So that may be the first, if you take a look at your bench, and, and maybe that's the first way you can start putting your group together. All right, we're going to um, move into the, uh, the delegate portion of this meeting, and what we're, we're going to ask each of you to do, and we're, we're going to ask, keep it kind of brief, but um, we're going to ask each delegate to stand, tell us your name, obviously, um, where you sit, give us one sort of burning issue in your jurisdiction as it relates to the judiciary. Um, tell us whether or not uh, you are, uh, whether your, your jurisdiction pays for you to attend uh, these meetings. And also tell us whether you're elected or appointed. All right, I know that's a lot, and we're gonna ask you to keep it keep it to answering those questions for us, okay? Um, and we're going to start with those who are on, who are joining us by way of court call. So I, we don't, we have two on, is that, how many do we have? Four, okay, so um, let's start, as far as I can tell, we have uh, uh, Judge Carol, is it Falve? Falve? It's Falve. Okay, it, can you, would you please introduce yourself and uh, tell us, answer those questions for us? I hope I can remember them all. Uh, I'm Carol Falvey, and I'm a judge in Florida, and um, I've been in Inverness 
I was appointed, not elected. As far as the burning issue that we have in Florida, it's judicial pay. And we just had a conference uh, call yesterday to outline our legislative priorities, and that's that's the hugest issue for any of the any of the judges in Florida. We haven't had a pay raise in in quite some time. All right, and I think one of the last questions was, and I probably know the answer since you're participating by way of court call. But um, does your jurisdiction pay for you to attend any of these meetings? No, they don't. And in fact, I'm I'm new to this. This is the first meeting I've attended. And I just got appointed a little while ago, and I'm trying to locate some source of funding for attendance, but I'm not aware of any at all. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. who, who is next on, I don't have another name. Alan, is it Alan? Okay, you're next. I'm, uh, I'm the Superior Court in Rhode Island. We are appointed, not elected. And uh, my jurisdiction does not pay for attendance at these Last meetings. part of what you said. My jurisdiction does not pay for the attendance at these meetings. Burning issue? Burning issue. Well, we've had uh, a lot of foreclosure cases in the Superior Court, and uh, the presiding justice has decided to appoint one judge to hear those cases because they've been very, uh, there's been so many of them. Um, and so we dealt with that issue by having a, uh, we usually don't appoint a special judge to hear a, a particular type of case, but that this was an exception. All right, thank you. Next we have, the operator can get the next person on. Your Honor, there are no other judges to know the conference. Okay, great. So now we're going to move to the room. And I'm Annette Sosinski, and I'm an Iowa delegate. In Iowa, our judges are appointed on a merit-based uh, system and uh, we stand for retention every six years at my level, of course, the state trial court. And um, our Iowa Judges Association has adopted a policy of uh, funding the participation of our delegates and that's been a tremendous help in getting three Iowa delegates um, here this year. I think the burning issue in Iowa right now is we're moving to a paperless court system and uh, we're closing in on having our entire state trial court system a uh, paperless and we're kind of worried about um, how we'll be able to maintain professional connections with the bar when we receive things from the bar um, chiefly through electronic means. We, we just had a state bench bar conference devoted to that topic. Hi, Chris Witt, Phoenix, uh, appointed by the governor uh, and then stand for retention election every four years. Um, we, I think this will be the first conference that Arizona, or that Maricopa County, Leslie Flood, so she'll be yellow because she's from Pima County. Maricopa County is now paying uh, part of the cost to the delegates, I, I hope. Um, the, I think the biggest issue uh, is the legislature has had a tax for the last four or five years on our some form of pay. They've taken, a, they've changed our pension program to a 401k that's less than the guy that's picking up the trash in front of our house kids now. So new judges are significantly impacted by um, the one benefit that we used to have that was really pretty good, which is we had a great pension. Now we don't. So that's been a big impact for us. Thank you. I'm Jill Strauss, I'm one of the delegates from Colorado, and I'm co-chair of the Juvenile Justice Committee for the Criminal Justice Section, so I would echo the encouragement of being involved um, in one of the sections because you really do get a lot of participation. Um, I am appointed district court judges, the upper level court. We are uh, stand for retention every six years, and our news is actually positive. The two burning issues for us turned out positive. We got 
significant raises this summer. And we just were notified that our Bar Association and the Colorado Judicial Institute, which is the group of attorneys supporting judicial education and integrity of the judicial system, were able to keep two measures off the ballot, which would have required judges to be retained by a two-thirds majority and take away review of judges from our Judicial Review Commission and give it to an independent body, which would have made all judicial reviews completely public, including issues of disability. And so they were just last week able to announce that they were able to keep those off the ballot in November. So the news for us has been positive this summer. i um, put a pause in this for just a second. Um, I understand that the leadership from one of our other um, joint dues uh, entities is here. Um, someone from TIPS, do you want to come forward and, and introduce yourself? And, and they're on their way to other meetings, so I wanted to let them have an opportunity to speak to you. Good morning. My name is Dan Gurash. Some of you may remember me as of the Lawyers Conference a few years ago. Um, but TIPS is joining uh, forces with some of the other uh, bar associations and, and DRI and ABOTA and putting together a fair court funding initiative this year. Um, under the leadership of Mike Drumkey, who is the incoming chair, we are putting together a toolkit uh, that will be available on our website to help lobby state legislators and executives for the proposition of fair court funding. Uh, tomorrow, we're putting together a video of uh, leaders talking about the issue. That'll be available to all of you uh, on our website, uh, the Court Calls website, and a couple other places, together with a toolkit that will allow you to use these tools to help the effort for fair court funding. So we've got the resources. We want to make them available to you. In the, this coming year, you'll probably hear from us about reaching out to your local bar association, the National Center for State Court Justices, Chief Justice, Council of Chief Justices, and the like, um, to help us get the word out on the fair court funding. Trial, court trial and insurance practice thing. Thank you. My name is Heather Welch, and I'm from Indiana, and I'm a trial court judge elected partisan in Indianapolis. Uh, I served newly appointed as the JD chair to the communications committee. I also handled the JD record for our um, conference. Uh, I would say the biggest issue we have is uh, state court funding, as Dan just said. I chair the um, budget committee for my court, and so we're looking at a deficit of about $5 million. And the problem that we have is our General Assembly has transferred costs to counties but not given us a funding mechanism. So it's for important programs like guardian ad litem on Chen's cases, um, paying our staff, court reporters, things of that nature. Good morning, my name is Robbie Hassel. I'm a trial court judge in North Carolina. We have a, a couple of burning and, and sub-burning issues, uh, most of which involve, of course, like everyone else, judicial uh, branch funding from the legislature, as well as the uh, issues of, of uh, judicial selection and elections. And particularly in North Carolina, uh, we were very proud. We had a run a few years back of uh, being able to uh, rid ourselves of uh, partisan elective systems at the district and superior court levels and then eventually at the appellate level as well and then overlaid that with uh, forward-thinking uh, public financing for our appellate campaign. Uh, the uh, turnover in the legislative uh, control uh, has uh, seriously eroded all of those things, uh, most recently uh, by eliminating public financing. And when you combine that with uh, the dark money that has flowed in, some of you have heard about what's been going on in North Carolina. I think some folks here looked at the 2012 elections um, in one of the Supreme Court races in particular. And this year, certainly, you know, we looked at what happened in Iowa. We are looking with concern at what is happening in Tennessee. And, and in North Carolina, the big out-of-state uh, advocacy money is flowing in, uh, unheeded, undocumented largely, and uh, not accountable to anyone. Uh, and four of our seven Supreme Court seats are up. Uh, 
and uh, we're very concerned about the role that that could play and, and uh, the dynamic uh, given what in North Carolina we've been fortunate to have is how people and the electorate view our uh, court uh, system in, in the whole and in, in particular at our appellate level. And so we're concerned about that. Good morning. My name is Lee Edmond. I'm a judge on the Los Angeles Superior Court. Uh, so I'm a California delegate. Uh, I will say that I, uh, in order to get one of my new colleagues off to a good start, who was just sworn in last week as a judge to our court, <laughs> and my husband, <laughs> I decided to drag him along and get a good start uh, in the division. Uh, so let's see, we are, uh, most of us are appointed when and have to go through a re-election every six years. Uh, and there is no funding for our delegates. Uh, it's a burning issue, like many of you, uh, ours is trial court funding. Um, they, they not, I know we are uh, not unique that we uh, had serious problems with funding over the last few years, resulting in huge cuts in our budget, uh, a number of rounds of layoffs, and uh, we are in California just starting to pull out of all of that. But as we do that, there are many people, as you know, standing in line for, uh, to get funding renewed. And so this year, our Chief Justice really went out and reached out to the legislature and said, uh, this is what we need, and uh, giving them a number of alternatives, this is what we need as a branch, but then as an alternative, uh, we'll take this that would literally just keep us at uh, survival rate, and we ended up getting just a fraction of that. So it continues to be a serious problem. I'm Philip Smith. I'm a trial judge in Georgia uh, on the Superior Court. Uh, I occupy a newly created seat. I was appointed by the governor and had the chance for re-election this year. We have nonpartisan elections, four-year terms. Um, the burning issue facing us, along with everyone else, is we haven't had a judicial pay raise in 15 years, and uh, I'm sort of leading from the behind on that because I just got the job, so it's a little untoward for me to start complaining about the pay as soon as I'm sworn in. But the, uh, the judiciary in Georgia is working with the legislature and the prospects look pretty good that we're going to get a raise, but we, we haven't had a raise and it's really impacting our ability to attract the best people uh, to the bench and uh, that, that's our, our issue. Good morning. I am uh, Sophia Hall. I'm the judge of the Circuit Court of Cook County. We are elected in Cook County and we serve for six years and run for retention. I'm also a um, uh, former chair of the, this uh, conference, Conference of State Trial Judges, and I do remember when everything was wonderfully funded and you got some support uh, from your states or your local bar associations to come and be a delegate here. Uh, we don't have that anymore. Uh, I do remember a time when this room was absolutely filled and we had larger rooms than this. But as you well know, <coughs> the participation in these come to and away uh, conferences, not just this one, but uh, others that you are familiar with, uh, that participation has decreased. Burning issue in our state is the protection of our pension funding. Uh, in Illinois, there has been I think we rank toward the bottom of funding for our pensions for all public employees and there have been various efforts to figure out how to handle that and of course the judges uh, whose uh, pay should not be decreased during their term of office, uh, their pensions uh, are not to be uh, reduced. However, for the new judges who are coming on, they've already um, addressed that and they get less pension uh, uh, expectation than we do uh, those of us who've been on for a while. Thank you. Uh, good morning from the other Washington. I'm from the Evergreen State, uh, Washington State. My name is Doug Fettersfield. We are elected on a nonpartisan basis. Uh, we serve four-year terms and then stand for re-election. Uh, the burning issue, with no pun intended, is marijuana. It's uh, <coughs> With. We are enjoying a robust debate about the tensions between state and federal rights. 
and it's playing out in our court. Uh, and just stand by and see what happens. Uh, there's some partial, uh, partial funding enough for a portion of the claim. Good morning. I'm Ger Gary Anderson from the state of Iowa, and Annette pretty well explained how uh, our appointment and retention goes on. Uh, another issue from the state of Iowa is judicial salaries. Uh, a year ago, they gave us a, a half raise and said, we, you'll get more this year, and then the legislature seems to have forgotten that promise this year. The other issue uh, upcoming will be our pension system, uh, and where the Judges Association, in conjunction with the, the Bar Association, is uh, going to be fighting any changes in our pension system, and hopefully that won't occur. Uh, uh, the uh, Annette also mentioned the electronic uh, uh, data system, and uh, in my jurisdiction, we started that. And uh, uh, several weeks ago, the computer crashed, and it was quite uh, a bad morning. Any, in any event, uh, uh, my other colleague, uh, Michael Schubot from Dubuque, is the next gentleman, and the uh, other Iowa delegate. Thanks, as Gary said, I'm Michael Schubach. I'm a trial court judge at a bit uh, Dubuque, Iowa. Um, There's 30 Iowa delegation to go, so they've taken all of the burning topics uh, that are going on in Iowa, the same thing that I, I was going to say. Um, the other two issues that uh, have been on my mind is uh, funding related, but the lack of uh, funding for mental health, uh, mental health resources that are available to us as uh, judges where people have to be uh, committed. Uh, there is really an alarming lack of options uh, for placement of people who are under commitment, uh, especially juveniles. The other burning legal issue in Iowa at this time is juvenile uh, sentencing for capital crimes under the Miller versus Alabama uh, ruling. We, like most other states, are uh, trying to sort that out through a series of uh, appellate decisions that are trickling in as to uh, as we're seeking direction on how these people are being sentenced. So uh, we're watching those across the country and with the United States. Come around to face y'all. Uh, I'm Mary Spencer McGowan from the great state of Arkansas, the Rock. Um, and, and the circuit judge, that's the trial bench in Arkansas. We run for election. Uh, we're now nonpartisan. This is my 24th year on the circuit bench, so I began running in partisan elections, but that changed in 2000. And we do get funding uh, from our state to come as delegates. Um, I think, and I have a colleague here, from, also from Arkansas, uh, and he can tell you other burning issues, many of which you have already addressed. Uh, but we, w we are now going into a legislative session in January and face uh, recall bills. We've had a couple of controversial um, decisions, including one by one of my uh, colleagues on same-sex marriage that has stirred up a hornet's nest. So we'll be dealing with uh, threats of recall as well as uh, funding. And we have started electronic filing, and it's a nightmare. I'm Ralph Wilson, also from Arkansas. And uh, my colleague, Judge McGowan, explained that uh, we're elected to nonpartisan six-year term. Uh, out of three of our delegates, I think our fund is to come by the state to come to the ADA meeting. I think she touched on the burning issues. Uh, basically, the judiciary is under attack, and uh, just like that in Arkansas, uh, there's another place that's uh, unfortunately left enlightened. Uh, legislators are getting elected, and it's hurting, and hurting everyone. One thing that uh, is one positive, though, our Chief Justice Jim Hanna has initiated a, a Arkansas court community initiative, ACCI, and judges and bar leaders around the state have been talking to service clubs around the state.
about uh, not using the judicial independence, but using like the ADA says, fair and impartial court judges. And uh, for the most part, I've spoken three times so far, and, and that program is well well received. We have a, pr a special person in the AOC that has developed the script and the, and the PowerPoint presentation. And once you put it in lay perspective and talk about the, the third branch of government only getting 1%, uh, it, it opens a lot of eyes. And that's, that's been good from, from a positive standpoint. So that's what's I guess good happening in Arkansas. Rachel Presser. I am a trial judge in New York. And um, we have uh, elected, mostly elected, partisan elections in that up state. New York City is, is almost a state unto itself. Most of their judges are appointed. Uh, I served for a 10-year term. I served for a 14-year term. So it depends on which court. These are superior courts. Um, and uh, the burning issue, I would say, in New York, at least as I see it, Alan will talk about the resource issues and we share many of the problems that you share with regard to resources. But um, I uh, had the judicial section of the state bar and we just issued a report on judicial diversity. And uh, that is a burning issue, I would say, in my opinion. But again, upstate, I'm from Albany. Downstate, huge difference. Uh, upstate, we have no women on the trial level. Uh, superior court judges is our superior court uh, We have the Court of Appeals, which is our highest military supreme. Um, no women in my district. 60% women in the New York City area, the first judicial district. Uh, no minorities ever. My name is Jerome Cole. I'm a trial judge and a delegate from upstate South Carolina. Uh, we are elected to six-year terms by the state legislature. Uh, we are reimbursed for our expenses here, our reasonable expenses. And uh, Judge Newman and I will have to get together on what, what the reasonable expenses are before we turn in our balance. Um, uh, I would say probably the burning issue is, is as it is with everyone, is state court funding, judicial compensation. But one issue we also have is a, li is a shortage of court reporters. And that apparently is not due to a lack of funding, but due to uh, a lack of interest. And I don't know what uh, can be done about re recruiting competent court reporters, but I know it's being worked on, but the success of it is is an issue that has not been resolved. So right now we are operating with a shortage and doing the best we can with the number of judges and the full personnel we have. Well, no, we, we just we, we just schedule the court as we can and, and we try to move court reporters around as good as we can or as best as we can. If you have a so if you have a term of court somewhere that shuts down or breaks down or finishes early and that sort of thing, and those court reporters have to be moved from one part of the state to another. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Alan Shankman. I'm from uh, New York, uh, White Plains, New York, which is in the Hudson Valley. And Rachel might look at me as a downstater. Uh, people from New York City might look at me as an upstater because there's a sign when you leave the Bronx that says upstate um, coming in my, in my direction. Um, I'm an elected state Supreme Court judge, which means that I'm actually a trial judge because New York has a very complicated system that it for everything. And our highest court, as Rachel mentioned, is the Court of Appeals, the state Supreme Court, on which I serve as the Court of General Trial Jurisdiction. 
I am also appointed in the sense that I am the administrative judge for my judicial district, which covers five counties in the Hudson Valley, about a hundred or so full-time judges, about a thousand non-judicial employees. I would say our, our biggest issue uh, is, fun, is a funding issue. I would say if I had had this conversation a few years ago, it would have been judicial compensation. Uh, but several years ago, the legislature created a commission to independently set the salaries of judges, and that's addressed that issue for the last several years. On the other hand, it's, it's exacerbated a funding problem because the governor and the legislature have essentially taken the position that's great, but that's coming out of the same pot that you've been given all along. So it just means you all get more, but you'll have fewer resources at the end of the day. Where so where we've been seeing a problem is with the staff. We have court reporter issues. I guess just like my colleague who just spoke, some of it is funding, frankly. Some of it is lack of, of interest. We are permitted by statute to use uh, tape recording electronics in family court and in certain city court proceedings, but generally not otherwise, so we scramble around. Unfortunately, we've had issues with court uh, security. We don't have enough court officers to go around. Some of you may know that a couple years ago we had a shooting in my district uh, in Middletown, New York, where uh, a, a very uh, mentally unstable individual came into the court actually looking for the mayor um, and was intercepted by court officers who, in defense of several people who were there in the court, actually shot and killed this individual. We were very lucky that day that we had enough officers there to deal with that situation. On some days, frankly, if he had picked another day, we might not have been so fortunate and had as good a, an outcome in terms of protecting uh, the public. We do use electronic fun, uh, filing in certain courts, but again, like New York being what it is, it's very complicated. Uh, inside New York City, the county clerks which who, with whom we have to interact with our filings, uh, outside of New York City, they're all independently elected. And every one of them has their own system of how they go about using computers. So we don't have the luxury of having one system that will connect with uh, all of these, we have to have a system that will connect with 57 different varieties. And we've been working through that in my district. I think we have two out of five civil cases that are, in five counties that all the civil cases are electronically filed. No criminal and no family court. Uh, there's a lot of legislative and policy concerns that go into that. And as for our reimbursement, uh, I'm the administrative judge. It's kind of hard for me to put in for myself but I'm going to wait and see how Rachel does. She's a great lobbyist, and I'm hoping that she will set the precedent. Thank you. I'm Pamela Michelle, and I sit within the city of Boston, so I didn't even think about me. Uh, I'll see what happens at the next meeting when it's outside the city. Uh, we are appointed, and I think one of the burning issues, there are several, a lot of dimensions for our judiciary, is that um, we are evaluated every three years. And it was determined in May or June that the judicial evaluation performance tool that has been in use for the past 10 years is uh, invalid as, a, as applied to minority judges. So now they're trying to figure out what to do, how to come up with a new tool. Um, I'm Matt Michelle, also from uh, my colleague and I joined us because we thought we'd get some nice travel. And so the first year we're here and you have in Boston. So. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to reimburse this. Um, we are appointed, uh, and um, my father-in-law was actually a judge on Hunting County. He's been on for 23 years, so it's interesting to see that every six years we have to run. And I'll say this quietly, you can get raised six years. Um, and when my father-in-law found out that he got a raise, he passed out on my kitchen and he president. Uh, but it's interesting to see their budget, I think, has been cut twice. Their salary's been cut twice since I've uh, known him. The burning issue is uh, those performance evaluations. Um, I'm a relatively new judge, so I haven't been evaluated yet, so I'm glad that maybe it will be pushed off <laughs> soon. Um, so. I'm Matt Nestor. I sit in Chelsea, the city that uh, bus Boston. Uh, as, they, as you've already heard, we are appointed. They didn't tell you that we're appointed for life. There's no retention. And we actually got a $30,000 pay raise. So I don't really have anything to complain about today. Um, but beyond the issue of uh, judicial evaluations, which, by the way, are anonymous, which I think, by definition, create huge issues, whether they're racial issues or 
uh, gender issues or any other bias issues. An, anonym, an anonymous survey, frankly, is no better than an internet bulletin board, but that's neither here nor there. One of the other issues that we have, obviously, is, is around judicial resources and, and court resources. Um, about a week ago, two weeks ago, the uh, chief of probation for the state was actually convicted in federal court um, for a patronage uh, scheme involving probation officers. And I think one of the things that that does is it, it erodes uh, confidence in the judicial system. And I think that's one of the reasons that we've had so many problems getting resources out of the legislature. The public sees this, clearly doesn't like it. I mean, some really ugly facts came out on how people were hired, how people were promoted. And I think that uh, we're going to have to deal with that before we can kind of go back to the legislature and say, you know, we really do need more funding. But it's great to be here um, because there's no travel for us today. But thank you. I'm Clifton Newman from the uh, mid-state of South Carolina. Carl says he's from upstate. I'm from the mid-state, Columbia. Uh, I also work heavily in the low country of South Carolina. Uh, we uh, rotate statewide. Uh, we're circuit court judges and we ride the circuit. Uh, so when he mentioned that the court reporters are moved around, uh, we move around as well because we are constitutionally mandated to, um, uh, to rotate uh, throughout the state for uniformity and other beneficial purposes. We are elected by the um, legislature, the state legislature, to a six-year term. And uh, every six years we reapply, we reevaluate it, and, uh, and uh, typically re-elected. Um, one of the burning issues that we're facing now is uh, the issue of uh, control of the criminal docket we're one of the few states where the prosecutor controls the, uh, uh, the, the docket, and the uh, Supreme Court has ruled that that's in violation of the U.S. Constitution. It's a big political fight to see how that uh, works out in the end, but that's one of the burning issues that we're facing. I'm Ed Patton, and I'm from the state of Mississippi, and I serve as a trial judge. In Mississippi, we have circuit and Chantry, and I'm actually a Chantry judge, which is the equitable division of, of, of the trial uh, courts. We handle all the family law, probate, annexations, things of that nature, all the equitable type of relief. We serve for four-year terms, uh, and this is an election year. I'm unopposed, which tells you I'm either doing an okay job or nobody wants to be a Chantry judge. Uh, the uh, state is funding uh, my attendance this year. Who knows whether they'll do it next year. We kind of go from year to year on things. We've fought the judicial salary battle for about 10 years and finally uh, got an arrangement with the legislature, which we all know going and groveling to the legislature is absolutely no fun and really is, in my mind, degrading for the judiciary to do. We are a separate and equal branch of government. We're dealing with electronic filing that is being implemented in our state, you know, basically court district by court district and making good progress with that. I would say the most pressing issue in Mississippi would be access to justice. The, the, the pro se litigant issue in our courts is very trying and we're attempting through a commission to make access to the courts better uh, and provide resources for these individuals that choose or cannot afford, more likely than not, uh, the, uh, the, the services of an attorney. And uh, we're always looking for resources in that regard. I'm Chad Smucker. I'm the president of the National Judicial College. And I'm not a delegate, but I couldn't resist when they passed the, the microphone to at least say hello. Um, I do want to thank the entire Judicial Division for the generous contribution we just received to, to the William Dressel Scholarship. But Bill Dressel was the president of NJC that I just replaced, and I believe he was the former chair of, of, this, uh, of this section. He was active in the ABA for decades, and uh, I want to thank you for that. Things are going well at the Judicial College. I hope to see you all at one of our courses in, in Reno or, uh, or somewhere else, and I, I just wanted to, uh, to say hello. Hi, I'm Marjorie Graves. I'm from New York, Queens County Supreme Court with my friends Rachel and Alan, upstate, mid-state, downstate. <laughs> um, I, my term is Rachel. Rachel and Alan have already told you about New York City, um, and we all suffer from the same 
issue from downstate more so judicial resources. Um, as essential personnel retires, budgetary concerns, they're not replaced, and we're expected to do less work, less, more rather with less. Um, and I think that's probably a statewide issue, not only a downstate issue. Um, I just want to say I'm a first time delegate. I had no idea about reimbursement, but I will find a form when I go back. Thank you for having me. Hi, I'm Megan Christopher, and I'm a probate and family court judge here in Massachusetts. I don't actually know if I'm a delegate. I know somebody asked me about it, and I sent my name in, and I really haven't a clue. So, uh, but I think from my perspective uh, as a relatively new judge, I've been really um, startled by the lack of resources for the judiciary and also just some of the way in which we utilize resources. I worked for legal aid for my entire career, and if we had a dime, my boss made sure we got 11 cents worth out of it. And um, my experience in, in estate is, hasn't actually matched that exactly. And um, in addition to which, I would say that just simple things, like not having a Xerox machine anywhere within a, I don't know, probably 500 feet of a courtroom. You know, you have to walk for a quarter mile to just make a Xerox. Those little things, and also the ability to, to have people who have um, any understanding of how the law operates at the counter and in the registry is eroded by the fact that we had a hiring freeze every court did all across the state. And so that um, some courts have very little staff in comparison to other courts because everything got frozen in place and people left. So that's been a big problem for us. Um, and we do have problems with security. I, I have one person in my courtroom, but if they go to get a, a prisoner or they do anything that they have to go out to do that's part of their job, there's no one in the room. And, uh, and that's not uncommon, not uncommon at all. So anyway, I'm really interested to hear what everybody else has to say, so thank you. Uh, my name is Dave Connors. I'm a uh, state uh, court, uh, state district court judge in Utah. That's our uh, court of general jurisdiction. Uh, we are initially appointed and sit for retention election uh, every six years. Um, let's see, of the four delegates uh, allocated Utah, one of us gets funded. That's why there's one of us here. And uh, so that, but we at least have that uh, representation. Uh, here at these conferences. Uh, in terms of burning issues, um, we have all of the same issues most of you have mentioned regarding uh, judicial compensation and resources uh, for the state courts, the tax on our pension plans. Uh, we've been through the transition to electronic filing, which seems to be working relatively well in our state. We've also been through transition away from live court reporters to you know, a full electronic uh, recording system, which has gone relatively well uh, in our state uh, as well. We're dealing with, and it sounds like Massachusetts has a similar situation, uh, the uh, establishment of a, of a judicial performance evaluation commission by the state legislature, uh, which seeks to uh, perform independent reviews of, ju of judges prior to retention election with what appeared at least to be the about purpose of trying to promote uh, additional turnover uh, in the judiciary. Uh, so far, we've been able to work pretty well with that group and, uh, and, and kind of hold them off and, and uh, get to a relatively objective uh, performance evaluation, but it's been a difficult uh, uh, situation to try to deal with. So that's one of our issues. Bill Caprazzi from Michigan, Bay City, Michigan, and uh, I am retired after 30 years as a trial court judge, but I'm still active, still sitting and doing some other things. A uh, couple, we're elected in Michigan for six-year terms, and uh, we've got a couple of issues. A lot of the ones that have already been talked about, but two others. The one's good and one's not so good. I'll start with the not so good one. Uh, our state bar took a position on dark money for the judicial campaigns. They were elected and they took a position that there shouldn't be any dark money in the judicial election. And that caused 
a reaction from a particular legislator and some others uh, to try to make the Bar Association uh, voluntary instead of mandatory. They, or they used the right to work uh, argument and passed, uh, or didn't pass, but wrote some legislation. And the Supreme Court then took it over. And so right now it's in the Supreme Court as to whether or not they want to regulate the Bar Association and make it some sort of a combination of uh, mandatory or voluntary. Right now it is a uh, combination where it, we have uh, aspects that are voluntary and then some that are uh, mandatory. So that's a big issue and uh, any help we can get in Michigan and trying to sort that out would be appreciated. The other one's the positive one that I think and that is we just uh, established a new business court and we're working on trying to educate the bench and the bar because it's going to really help, I think, uh, move the dockets along and make the uh, business court cases more accessible to uh, our system so that they don't have to uh, lose all their uh, at stake by litigating and can resolve those earlier. I'm also a past chair of this conference, and now I'm uh, the liaison to the dispute resolution section and a member of the dispute resolution section membership committee. I would welcome everyone to consider the joint uh, membership for the dispute resolution section. Uh, for those who are going to be retiring and they want to do uh, dispute resolution, it's a great way to meet the people and figure out how to get that set up and go about that. And the other aspect is uh, there are a lot of things that you can do while you're sitting on the bench still to resolve issues that you can learn about through the dispute resolution section as well. We're going to do a joint uh, called the Brown Bag Lunch uh, early next year. We're hoping to do We're working on it right now. And we're going to put together uh, a mediator, a trial court judge, and a uh, litigator and compare uh, settlement conferences, judicial settlement conferences with mediation. And so we welcome you to all participate in that. That will be free because it's not CLE, but it should be very informative. Thank you. Uh, pardon me? Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> we, we meet around the country. Stay within the board. Uh, good morning. I'm Marcella Holland from Baltimore, Maryland, and until about eight months ago, I was Chief Administrative Judge for the Circuit Court of Baltimore City. i uh, retired, but like Bill, still active, still advising the court. Uh, we are appointed in Maryland, and then we must run in the next general election, and we have a 15-year term once we run, uh, and then you have to run again in a contested election. I, I'm got, we have another delegate here, so I'm going to let her tell you more about what the burning issue may be today. I can tell you, though, when I was there, and it's still going on, we are also becoming an electronic court, and that's been a issue for the last three, four years, and we've also been battling pension reform and funding for our judges. Uh, I serve as chair of the this section, diversity committee and criminal justice section, and I'm a liaison from the judicial division to the Council on Racial and Ethnic Diversity and Profession uh, and uh, other diversity issues, Standing Committee on Diversity. So anyone uh, interested, please. There is a great program tomorrow, uh, the Freedom Riders, a great panel discussion from, from the council. I encourage all of you to attend that. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jim Jordan. I am a general jurisdiction judge from Dallas, Texas. And uh, we have also been going through electronic filing. I, a few years ago, it was a burning issue. Now, I guess it's probably more of a smoldering issue. And we still have some uh, issues to, to resolve, but we're getting there. Um, I guess uh, a reoccurring burning, burning issue in uh, Texas is the selection of uh, judges. Uh, I uh, am elected in a partisan uh, race. Uh, every four years, uh, which means every four years uh, I've run in two elections, a general election and a prim or primary election and then a general election. And uh, some of the, uh, it's not unusual in some of the larger uh, urban areas that when we have wave elections for all the city judges to be replaced by new incoming judges. 
uh, strictly on party affiliation. Uh, so judicial selection is usually a topic that uh, uh, comes up after every general election. The uh, qualifications for being a judge in Texas are constitutional and they're simply that you live in the district where you run. I think there's an age qualification of 28 uh, and that you've been a lawyer for four years. And if you have those things, then you're qualified to be a judge as long as you win your election. Uh, it's also not unusual in um, some of the larger urban counties uh, like Dallas uh, that if you're in a contested race that um, you're raising anywhere from $250,000 to $350,000 uh, to win your race. Um, raised largely, if not exclusively, from the attorneys who come appear in the court. Uh, at the higher level in the Supreme Court, uh, the money raised there is in the millions. So, Anyway, let's see. Uh, that, that's uh, probably a burning issue that, that, that we have to face every four years. I'm Carol Privet. I'm a circuit court judge in Birmingham, Alabama. That's the general trial court, only I only do civil cases, which is a luxury. Uh, and I don't have a court reporter. The lawyers in my court have to, have to pay for a court reporter and bring them in. Uh, criminal court judges do have court reporters. But, uh, civil judges, and, and our court is the only court that does that in the entire state. So it was a finance issue. Burning issue, and I'm, um, I'm elected. I was appointed by a commission to fill a vacancy, then had to run, uh, and our elections are very partisan, um, put it mildly. Uh, but I ran once opposed and once unopposed, and the latter is much better. Um, but, uh, and I, our, our terms are six years, um, and I will retire before the end of this one. So um, I am, uh, I don't get any money to come here, um, and neither does my colleague, Jean, sitting here. Um, we, we just sort of are, I guess, bar junkies or something. I'm not sure why we, we've been doing this for so long. The burning issues in Alabama are, are all dealing with um, funding. Uh, we thought we are, are there, the legislature is threatening to uh, do something about pensions, particularly for in new judges. We have to have a very good pension system right now for judges, which makes the low pay that we receive uh, far more uh, palatable because we have a good retirement system. Uh, we, and if they take that away, there's no telling what will happen. We also have issues of, of of allocation and where judges are going to go and when I retire there is some thought that my slot might end up in another county uh, and uh, I'm trying to retire so before that mechanism can happen so that to keep it in my county for just one reason. So those are sort of, those are the issues I think. Judge Griffith. Good morning. My name is Eugene Barron. and I'm from um, Bessemer, Alabama. And um, things are just great in Bethlehem, Alabama. They hadn't always been that way. Uh, during the 16 years that I was on the, I've been on the bench full time, um, my predecessor was removed for incompetency, racism, sexism. Um, my wife, um, she sits on the circuit judge as well, but her, her predecessor also has been criminally indicted. Um, I've suspended twice, once during the campaign, but uh, for the past two years, we've done pretty good. And it's um, <laughs> very good. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that's right. So it's all, it's all good now. For those of you who have never been in a situation where your colleagues are really unprofessional and unethical, you're blessed. I feel great going to work every day. What Judge Privet doesn't realize is that um, the presiding judges of your jurisdiction can provide for funding to come here. I am now the presiding judge, so I do get funding to come here. Uh, but, uh, thank you. <laughs> Good morning, judges. I'm Julie Weatherly. I sit on the circuit courts of Prince George's County, and I'm one of the Maryland delegates. In the past, we've been funded to send three delegates here. We now have a new chief judge, so we shall see when these invoices get sent 
set out whether we continue to receive funding. One of the major issues in Maryland that took place in the past year is we had an appellate case that came down and said that defendants were entitled to representation when they are arraigned before commissioners, which is like in the middle of the night. And suddenly we had a, to figure out how to put public defenders, private attorneys, and of course because they were there, the state's attorney felt that they ought to weigh in on this 24 hours a day. And the legislature was fairly miffed by this and said, here's a small amount of money, make do forever and never come back for more. So that will be a real challenge, challenge to the Bar Association that stepped up to the plate to help represent these folks. Um, we talked about night court, we've had other kinds of changes. It was a very large issue and it's just beginning to play out. I, my heart has gone out to people who are um, transforming into um, recorded testimony as opposed to court stenographers. I love court stenographers. I would tell you, be aware if you're going to go there. I looked at a transcript the other day and I was instructing the jury and I told them that liability was not an issue, but it was transcribed as my ability is not an issue in this trial. <laughs> you might want to read those transcripts when you go. I'm April Sellers White from Oklahoma. I retired from the trial bench after 27 years. Um, I, I will tell you there are many opportunities for service as a judge in retirement that were invisible when I was still serving. Uh, but because I'm still involved in the state judges council, the executive board as the representatives of retired judges, I have probably more understanding of what's going on than I did. Uh, when I first retired and was just playing hooky. Um, Oklahoma judges are elected. Uh, if you take office in the middle of a term, you're appointed by the governor and then stand for re-election at, the next, uh, at the next opportunity, but it is a contested election. It is non-partisan, which means your family and friends have to get out and support you. I don't know what dark money is, but I suspect it might be like what the DA's office has by way of black budget, which is no accountability, no, no um, records uh, sort of funding. Um, if we have that in judicial elections, nobody offered me any of that. But the um, main issues right now facing Oklahoma judges are a legislature that number one, believes we are not a separate branch of government, and number two, believes we can't be trusted. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Rick Bozart. Uh, I'm uh, from Oklahoma. I'm an associate district judge, which, which is an elected judge, as April said. Um, uh, I might be characterized as a county trial judge. I do everything that comes into that county. There's no divisions at all. Uh, I've been on the bench about eight years. Uh, it's interesting that every problem that everybody has, has spoken about today are problems that we have in Oklahoma. And it's still not that bad a system, but we've still got lots of problems that we have to deal with. The court reporter situation is out there. Access to justice is a problem that we have uh, in, in Oklahoma. Our legislature is uh, probably 90% of those people are absolutely opposed to anything the, the, the judiciary wants or asks for, any ideas, anything that we promote. Any decision that our Supreme Court makes is, uh, uh, for example, to, uh, to, to uh, overturn the law because it's unconstitutional. It's because we're judges that we're doing that, not because it's unconstitutional. They have no clue what the Constitution is in Oklahoma. So look, that's a real problem with our legislature. Um, the, the, uh, as far as funding, uh, uh, our judicial conference uh, gave April and I some money to come here. Probably not all of our money to come here, but that's what gets us here. It's not state-funded money at all. Uh, one of the major issues that trial judges in Oklahoma have to deal with is we spend an inordinate, inordinate amount of our time uh, collecting court fees and money from poor people. Our whole system, for the most part, 
We don't get much money from the legislature. We collect, we collect and generate our own money from court fees, and so we run our system on the backs of poor people in Oklahoma. And uh, been that way for a long time. I don't think it's going to change very much, but we spend a lot of time with poor people for money that they don't have that they need to give to their kids to, to you know, buy some groceries. You know, we got to get that we we have to come get get that money from them so they can keep out of jail, and, and that's going to be an issue uh, uh, in the in, in the future, I think, in Oklahoma and, and as well as across the United States. So glad to be here. Been a member of the ABA for 40 years. This is the first time I've come to a convention, so it's pretty cool. Good morning, I'm Pete Buckstam. I'm a, re a retired Superior Court judge in New Jersey, but I'm back on recall, working as little as I can, but a little bit. Um, we never fund anybody to go anywhere. So uh, I'm sleeping with a, at a friend's apartment and drove down with another friend. Um, we have a tough situation. Uh, a number of years ago, a the governors and the legislature agreed on a pension uh, increase, I mean not an increase, but an increase in payments. Courts held that it could not apply to the judiciary and uh, that matter was uh, then submitted to the people who voted 82 to 18 that it should apply to the judiciary. And our system was so cowed at that point that even though the amendment seemed to contemplate action by the legislature to implement those changes, we all agreed to uh, an administrative implementation because we were afraid of what would happen if the legislature actually got its hands on implementation of those cuts. As a result, we, uh, those of us who will staying on a bench will suffer a, a roughly $15,000 effective pay cut over the course of uh, five or six years. So the morale in the system is not exactly wonderful at this point. The other thing we have going is a real conflict between our governor, Governor Christie, and the Democratic legislature over appointments. It took a year to replace me, during which time there were no civil trials whatsoever in my county. It was a small county, and I was the only civil judge there. And, and that's not going to change until September. Um, in Essex County, which includes Newark, our largest county, there was a three or four year old feud over uh, appointment of judges. As a result, there were 21 vacancies which is one third of the vacancies in the busiest trial county, trial court county in the state. He appointed, he named eight people, but there was a little fuss about one of them, so he withdrew the nomination. Um, the governor did not reappoint for the first time since our new constitution in 1947, which was authored by Dean Vanderbilt of Columbia Law School. Uh, he did not reappoint two sitting Supreme Court justices to, uh, for tenure. Our system is you're appointed for seven years and then you get tenure after seven years. It had always been taken that you really had to screw up badly uh, to not get reappointed. But you did not reappoint one judge that was then the only African American and only South Jersey judge over the court. And then did not reappoint for some reason, hard to figure, a judge who actually was a Republican who supported him in almost every uh, vote she took. Uh, so we have a, we. <laughs> Houston, we have a problem, um, and I'm not sure what the what the ultimate outcome is going to be. But we always prided ourselves since our 1947 Constitution as being one of the best systems. We have one of the flattest systems in the country. Uh, there's just three courts: the Supreme Court, Appellate Court, and the Superior Court. That's it. That's all family, all chancery, all criminal, everything. So the organization system is inherently a very good one. But we're really going through some very hard times now. And that's the cheerful news. Good morning. My name is Elihu Burrow. I sit on the Superior Court in Los Angeles. And it's wonderful to see such a great turnout from so many different uh, states in our country. Uh, and it's wonderful to be here. This is, as everyone knows, this is the largest and greatest conference of state trial judges in the country. So it's very, uh, a very wonderful opportunity to be able to speak to everyone. Uh, I would now like to yield the floor to my colleague from Los Angeles, who is also a former chair, Ramona. Uh, 
Collins, going to give you an opportunity to speak. Uh, with regard to the specific issues that have been raised in California, most judges are first uh, initially appointed by the governor, there's some exceptions, but after initial appointments, uh, judges stand for election every six years. Uh, uh, they could be contested elections, but they're nonpartisan. Uh, the major issue that has faced our judiciary over the last uh, six and a half, eight years uh, has been the budget. Uh, the severe cuts in the budget statewide, and we've suffered that extremely in Los Angeles, more or less been stabilized, but nevertheless, we are now operating with a reduced budget, which means severe cuts in services to the public. Among other things, uh, we do not have uh, reporters in civil cases. We've had a cut down in a number of courtrooms with respect to uh, areas that um, uh, community uh, needs, local, uh, for example, small claims, unlawful detainers, with individuals who cannot afford lawyers, who pull pervs here. Uh, additionally, in terms of uh, domestic relations and the traffic court situations, individuals have to have long waits and lines to have their cases heard, and it's a severe imposition on the public as far as access to uh, uh, justice. We do not receive any pay to attend here at the meeting. Nevertheless, it's wonderful to see so many judges from Los Angeles and Ramona C. and Andy Edmund and um, appointed Judge Richard Bird. It's wonderful to be here. My name is Linda Bell. I'm a delegate from Las Vegas, Nevada. We do get partial funding to come here. Uh, judges in Nevada, our state trial judges, are elected for a six year term on paper. It's nonpartisan, but it's really very partisan. Um, and the burning issue in our state is the creation of an intermediate court of appeals. We are one of the few states that does not have one, and it's going to the voters again. So we'll see if that gets the first because we really need one. Good morning. Laura Livingston from Austin, Texas. Four year term, partisan, very partisan, and no, no hiding that back. Uh, the burning issue for us is the unaccompanied children coming up from Central America into every county in our state, and it's really a hot topic, and we're trying to figure out a way of handling that issue humanitarily uh, and sensitively, uh, but also legally, so it's quite the complex issue. Um, and Oh, funding. Uh, the state does not uh, the state does not reimburse us as delegates, but we have local funding in my county for travel to TLE and other expenses, and so I'm using local money to do my state work. Good morning. I'm Calvin Scott. I'm from the Superior Court in Delaware. We are appointed for a term of 12 years. By constitution, we have to be politically balanced. The burning issue in our state are irregularities in the medical examiner's office and missing drugs from the drug lab. Yes, the state pays our expenses. Hi, I'm Ramona C. I'm from Los Angeles. I'm going to talk faster. I'm going to get the hook from Tony. Everything's been said about uh, California. Uh, I do want to mention one thing because Lee is, is uh, you know, so humble. She was just appointed by our governor to the Court of Appeal. So I want everybody to know that. Uh, I don't know. Do you want statistics now or are we going to do that in the panel? Okay. Good morning. I'm Guy Reese from Columbus, Ohio. We are elected six-year terms. Um, one thing I wanted to comment on was e-filing. In our county, we've done e-filing, all courts, including the appeals court. Matter of fact, this morning I signed about 25 orders, uh, decisions that have been made in orders. Uh, uh, we're decentralized, our courts are decentralized for funding. Judges are paid statewide from the state, and judges' salary, that's the big issue for us. Uh, locally, I am. Uh, the county does. And I understand we had another delegate join us um, on court call, Jeff Cox. Um, we would just ask you to introduce yourself, tell us what court you're from, uh, let us know uh, whether you're uh, how, whether you're appointed or elected, um, one burning issue in your jurisdiction, and whether or not well whether or not you would be reimbursed for coming if you came to the meeting. 
My name is Jeff Cox. I'm with the 26th Judicial District, which covers Bossier and Webster Parishes in the state of Louisiana. Uh, we would not be reimbursed if we came to the conference. I would love to come to the conferences, just be able to participate. Uh, just I am duty judge this week and have a heavy trial docket and we'll have to leave in just a few minutes to handle cases. We're a general jurisdiction so we handle all cases and I have three trials set for today. Uh, a burning issue that we're having at the present time is funding like everybody else. I mean our Supreme Court has been tremendous in trying to make sure that we get pay raises and trying to make sure that our courts are funded, but we're having to watch our budgets uh, extremely hard right now with everything that's going on because funding has been very critical. The other thing is, I heard someone mention about court reporters. Uh, we have a new certification procedure in our state, and I believe that we're going to have a shortage of court reporters in the future that we're going to have to face in the state of Louisiana. So we will be watching that. But it's an honor to be able to participate, an honor to be a delegate to the National Conference. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, all right, so I think we've heard from all the delegates who are either here in the room or on court call. We have, we do have a, a presenter to discuss with us some budget issues and some ways to deal with budget issues, but we have one last bit of business that we have to do today. Um, and that is election, so I'm going to turn it over to our chair of the uh, nominating committee. I'm Bill Carpenter. And, um, I'm really glad to see the New York delegation here. We really, and I'm my roommate in the law school was Gerard Maney. So, uh, so uh, uh, what Calvin did not tell you is that yes, we have a medical examiner problem. I'm the one who's going to have to decide whether we're going to throw out the cases, all drug cases since 2010. But uh, we'll see. The other big burning issue is Rule 61, the appointment of counsel, and the initial Rule 61 petition. So. That's a big issue for us. <laughs> Fortunately, we do not get elected. We are appointed, but my appointment is ending in two years. So I'm not sure why, they, or maybe that's why they gave it to me. Um, I am your um, nomination, uh, chair of the nomination committee. Um, and the, I'm going to sit down so I can read my, my report. The nomination committee um, met at the mid-year meeting. Um, and created a slate of nominees. The, um, they were published in the, um, our news um, journal, and no additional uh, petitions or nominations have been received, and by our Constitution, they had to be received within 60 days of the annual meeting. So this is a nomination report without any uh, addition. For Chair-elect um, Annette Suzinski, um, we see the council table here. For uh, Vice Chair Cheryl Snaria, who's sitting next to her. Um, and for Secretary Judge Calvin Scott from Delaware, sitting right over there. For the uh, 2016 Board of Directors, the nominees are Linda Bell from Las Vegas, um, John Brown from Virginia, who I don't believe is here. Um, Dave Connors from Utah, behind us. Um, Marcella Holland from Maryland. And, and Gary Randall, who is not here, he's from Nebraska. His, his uh, significant other has a um, broken foot, so he stayed home. Crushed foot, yeah. Um, the Chris Ridden, who is the vice chair at the moment, or chair elect at the moment, will become our chair by, um, by constitutional provision. So I um, move the nominations uh, be approved. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Okay, I need, uh, yeah, I have it. I need Oh, on the phone. Sorry to those on the phone if you couldn't hear me. 
uh, for the House of Delegates uh, representative recommendation from the nominating committee is Judge uh, uh, William Carpenter from Delaware. Those who put in, who put in, and because Judge Carpenter was one of them uh, who, who uh, put in uh, for the position, um, Judge C took over that portion of that meeting. So I just wanted to make that clear because it is in the report, and I just wanted to make sure everyone was aware of that um, that fact. So. Uh, is there anyone who will move that? A second. All right. All in favor? Any opposed? At the, um, we are now, we're, we're a little bit behind schedule, but I realize that some of you might need a little break. So um, our presenter is here. We're gonna let her get set up. We're gonna give you about a five minute break, and then we're gonna move right into um, her presentation. Um, so while she's getting set up, if you need to take a break, do so.
All right, I'm going to ask everyone to take your seats, please, um, so we can get, I know. Let's go, let's go, let's go. We, we, we want to try to finish so that we can go to the, uh, the program this morning so that people can be freed up to do that. Um, we, we may be running a little over, but I think it's worth it. So uh, if we can get started. Um, we, um, we, we anticipated um, and based on some comments over the years that uh, uh, court funding is really a, a burning issue. Um, for many of us in the, in the country. And so um, what I'm going to do is ask Justice Martin to come up and explain what the Conference of Chiefs Judges uh, has been doing over the last year uh, in, an, in an effort to kind of deal with this, this issue. And so I'm going to ask him to come up and explain what they've been doing. He can do it better than I can because he is, after all, involved with that. Sandy, I don't think I can do anything better than, better than you, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to take a try. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, wonderful to be here with you and uh, looking forward to my dear friend Rosalind Frierson and her remarks. And Rosalind was a part of these meetings. And so just briefly stated, all of us know that court funding is the work of a lifetime. It's nothing we really achieve this ultimate objective of all, of all state and federal justice systems being fully funded. But we do know that we have to stay attentive in each of our jurisdictions to developing adequate and sustainable funding for the operations of the courts. Um, this past year, one of the judicial division initiatives was the collaborative court funding initiative. And what was notable about it is that this division uh, was placed upon the conference agenda for three regional meetings of the Conference of Chief Justices. And in collaboration with CCJ, the National Center for State Courts, and the ABA Task Force on Preservation of the Civil Justice System, uh, JD was a collaborator in trying to develop best practices and new approaches, really innovation for trying the best practices to get at that legislature and to get funding for our courts. I say this on first-hand experience in my state where our technology budget was just cut by 24 percent at the very time that we're trying to move forward on e-filing and virtual courthouse projects. Now I'm very proud of what Rosalind and her Chief Justice have done in South Carolina on e-filing and maybe she'll have a chance to uh, address that in her remarks. But anyway I look forward to joining with you to hear Rosalind and thank you so much for coming this morning. Thank you. Um, Rosalind Frierson was appointed Director of South Carolina Court Administration uh, by the South Carolina Supreme Court in 1998. She's a graduate of the University of South Carolina School of Law and holds a BS degree in Business Administration from the University of South Carolina. Uh, she previously served as a, a South Carolina Supreme Court staff attorney, law clerk to former Chief Justice Ernest Finney Jr., and research budget analyst for the Ways and Means Committee of the South Carolina House of Representatives. Uh, she also served as a legal writing instructor at the uh, USC School of Law. Uh, she currently serves as substitute uh, municipal court judge for the city of Columbia. She is a member of many uh, bar associations, organizations, and I'm not going to go through the whole list. Um, she uh, has participated in the three-year executive session of the state court leaders in the 21st century at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government is a graduate of the Furman Diversity Leadership Institute and the South Carolina Executive Institute. I will tell you that everyone I've spoken with about this presenter says she's a rock star. Um, most of you know Judge James Lockamy, who's um, a former member of our, of our conference, who's now in the appellate court, uh, basically said, if we can get her, you don't need anybody else. And so, um, and, uh, so she's going to talk with us about not just, we, we all kind of know what the issue is, um, but we are, we're looking for some potential solutions and how uh, different states are dealing with the issue across the country. So I'm going to turn it over to you, and thank you very much for taking time out to come join us. Thank you, Judge Clark, and thank you to Mr. Dizzy for having me. Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on. Uh, we do have a, a PSA. 
Just one quick thing. Yesterday at the joint JD TIPS task force meeting about court funding, they had asked if we would record this session, which we have. Now, I probably should have said that at the beginning, but if you have any concerns and you do not want your image or your words or anything used, just please come and get me. I'll be here the whole time. Uh, but uh, as Dan Gorash in the back, uh, he and I were just talking, he said this is very illuminating towards their project to actually hear what the real judges are saying about the issues of court funding it will be extremely helpful to them. So uh, come and see me if you have any questions, and sorry to interrupt. Good morning again. Thank you. It's an honor to be here before you. Um, I heard some of the conversations prior to this session about the um, challenges that you're facing in your state. And I should say I'm from South Carolina, so I'm well aware of the challenges that you face. And also I should say as part of the um, Conference of State Court Administrators, we meet with the Conference of Chief Justices once a year. And always, often throughout the year, we're having discussions and um, trying to figure out how we can help each other as it relates to budget issues. So it, I can say that it is really at the top of the um, minds of all of the Chief Justices across the state. I thought this was a pretty good graphic, and this is coming from Massachusetts. What if courts close? And that's really kind of what we're talking about, what can be done to make sure that that doesn't happen. Although in a lot of states, I know that it's very close to that with some of the shutdowns and reduction in staffing, reduction in court time, but that's a really, um, it's kind of a scary thought, what if court closed. But adequate funding, we all know, is crucial to maintaining the rule of law. Quality of daily life is at stake, justice, public safety, the timely resolution of disputes, and the freedoms that we take for granted every day. Let me start by talking about a little bit about background. I know you all are familiar with what's happened in your state, but just to kind of give it an overall perspective, um, the effects of recession. The state's judiciary is still recovering from the recession in 2001 to 2003, and the most recent recession that began in 2008. 10 to 15% funding was we received less than 10%, 10 15% less funding than we had in 2007, so we're losing ground as opposed to gaining ground. The proportion of state and local budgets represented by even a fully funded court system is quite rank small, and it's in a range of 1 to 2%. And given that our courts are really 90% personnel, the budget cuts really have a tremendous impact on our courts. The court should not have the ability simply to postpone executive items to a more robust economic time, and reductions in court funding directly and immediately curtail, curtail meaningful access to the justice system. Desperate times call for desperate measures. Several, several states have implemented both short and long-term solutions. 28 states have delayed filling judicial vacancies, 31 judicial support positions, and 34 vacancies in clerk's offices. 31 states have either frozen or reduced the salaries of judges or staff. 16 states have furloughed clerical staff with commensurate reductions in pay, and nine have extended those furloughs to judges as well. While state revenues are coming back, they're not coming back to reach the levels they were prior to 2008. The aging population means that fewer people will be paying taxes, putting pressure on available resources. The basic principle, and this was uh, the, uh, I guess you could call it principle for judicial administration that was developed by the court community at large. It included um, discussions and work with the Conference of Chief Justices, the Conference of State Court Administrators, NACOM, that's the National Association of Court Managers, and the ADA. But the key principle is that courts should be funded so that cases can be resolved according to recognized time standards by judges and staff operating within, within adopted workload standards. And this links accountability with funding. And I think that's one of the main key things that we've um, discovered or really come to the conclusion through all of the discussions about the crisis and what can be done, but what is really 
necessary is to make sure that we can link accountability with the funding. Step one, budget request should be based solely on demonstrated needs, including transparent workloads. Budget request should be considered by legislative bodies as submitted by the judicial branch, and courts should be flexible in how they handle funds. And that's the ideal. Not every state has that. But in addition to that, we also must be good stewards of the funds that are appropriated. Legislatures should fund courts to back those basic principles. Um, Developing good working relationships with the legislative and executive branches is key to securing adequate funding. The National Center for State Courts, along with the Conference of State Court Administrators, has suggested a list of best practices as it relates to the operation of state judiciary. We need to be able to demonstrate to court that court leaders are good stewards of funds appropriated. And some of these best practices include a lot of the things that I've heard you all say that you're doing in your state. Almost all states have some form of problem-solving courts, video conferencing, online payment, technology, e-commerce, digital recordings of court proceedings. And, um, but essentially, all courts must look at re-engineering their business processes to be as efficient as possible. We're competing for scarce resources you know, we're competing with prison, education, highways, human resources, but we're, we're competing with those, those groups, those reasons for funding, and so we've got to be able to dem demonstrate that we're using our resources wisely. And I won't go through the states, um, the problems, the different states that are, that have problems solving courts for the different types, but I'm sure you all are familiar with those. But as far as video conferencing and digital court recording, Half the states are transitioning to digital court recording. Some states nearly exclusively on dig have digital recording, including Utah, Vermont, and New Mexico. And one third are using remote video conferencing of in interpreters. And I know you might ask, why am I going through all of this? And But I don't know that there's a real rocket answer about how you get funding from your legislature. It's kind of a, a big conglomerate, I guess you could say, of a lot of things that will, will that you got to do. Because to begin with, we're not going to get the kind of funding that we've gotten in the past, so we really are in a new normal. We've got to really readjust what our needs are, but along with what our needs, we need to be sure that we're, we're, we can demonstrate that we're operating efficiently. And that's what we as court administrators and chief justices have really worked hard to try to figure out what can we do to make sure that we are being efficient. And then I will get to some of the messages that have been used around the country as far as trying to accomplish um, more funding. 28 states have engaged in serious restructuring efforts to continue to deliver services. The work is has been, um, I guess we all are familiar that the workload for you as judges has increased, but the number of judges have remained pretty much constant. So you're, you're really kind of doing more with less is probably a good way of describing. So with that in mind, structuring, restructuring, re-engineering are essential for all of the states. One third of the courts are operating with nearly 10% fewer staff. And just as some examples, North Carolina cut state level administrative positions by delay, lead delaying, excuse me, especially in technology management. New Hampshire is undergoing a, a tremendous administrative restructuring where they reduce expenditures and preserve services by shifting resources from management to case processing and customer service. They also centralize their dictation center for all judges' courts. Iowa has done electronic data management systems in order to allow the courts to restructure the trial court support staff. Utah has gone on, undergone major, major and restructuring and as I mentioned they are kind of the model for us as other states regarding court interpreters and not having live court reporters anymore so there's a real sea shift in how things are being handled within the court. Minnesota has transitioned from county funded confederation to state funded a uh, state funded unified branch and they've reduced the county level administrators by one-third and have provided a centralized self-help center. 
Vermont has transitioned to state funding with all court staff having comparable pay and benefits. Oregon, again, has had a centralized, implemented a centralized health center. Governors, um, just a, a few examples, Louisiana has a comprehensive training on governance issues, including the role of the chief judge and the relationship between the chief judge and the judicial administrator. Florida adopted rules to strengthen governance, addressing the role and responsibility of the Supreme Court, the chief judges, the state court administrators, the judicial management council, and the council of judges. And all of that has been to strengthen communication within the branch. And I want to try to, moving kind of quickly because I know you want to have time to have some open dialogue, but there are numbers of examples of um, governance changes. As far as resource allocation, Virginia, as an example, has reallocated judicial resources based on a workload analysis. And you'll hear more about that where state courts are looking at examining the workload that you're doing to try to figure out how you can readjust. I know one of the, the um, issues in some states where it's pretty rural and you have judges who have a, uh, so the workload is not evenly distributed and trying to figure out how to accomplish that so that workload can be redistributed given that we're not getting more resources in areas where there is a greater population or greater workload. Um, in Nebraska there was a recent workload study that reallocated sources where resources were needed. Technology. I think everybody is um, aware that technology is here, it's here to stay, and e and if it hasn't gotten to your state, it's coming. But there are a number of states who have e filed We're in the process of, of doing that. In South Carolina, we were fortunate that the legislature gave us $5 million to begin that process, and we're in the early stages of it and hope to have a college started this fall. This fall. Well, I shouldn't say the fall because it's here, so now I'll say the spring, but it's coming. But the, the good story is that the legislature, we didn't have to really make a case. In fact, they came to us and asked, what is it that you have a need for that we can get money that will get the best bang because they had confidence in the, the, the judicial department and being good stewards of those funds. So e-filing was funded, but in a lot of states, e-filing is being funded by fees or by users. In, Mid in Delaware, they have a technology, technology replacement special fund for their technology. In Kentucky, I understand that they have gotten a 28.1 million agency bond, and Oklahoma, I understand, is a revolving fund. Now I just want to talk a little bit about South Carolina. In 2010, our general revenue had been cut cumulatively by 40.75% in 19 months. When we were facing our 2010-2011 budget year, our budget committee, the Ways and Means Budget Committee, had recommended an additional reduction. And that really kind of alerted us that we needed to have a new strategy on how we got funding from the legislature. So our Chief Justice went around the state and she met with different, different organizations to tried to develop a coalition. She met with agencies such as, well not agencies, but organizations such as Boeing, whose general counsel was a former member of the Fourth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals, and whose local counsel was a former chief judge of the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. And they both understood that what the court's needs are and the import, importance of courts to business. And that is one of the, the, I don't know whether that's been something that you have tried in your state, but what was really effective was to get the business community involved because they're the ones who know and can see the impact of if we have a lack of access to the courts, how it can directly benefit businesses. If, it, if they're looking to move into your state, if they see a non or dysfunctional court system, then that can affect whether they're able to get their litigation through, um, their civil litigation through. If they're asking people to move to that state, you know, it's important to know that their, their employees will be able to have access to a court system that is functioning, that they will not be, for example, if they have employees who have domestic matters, but they're not able to get those moving, and that kind of affects their work, their, their productivity. 
So it's really a, an, an effect on everybody when courts do not run. I think we always think that if we don't have courts, then we think about the criminal system. But I think we've got to get people thinking about what courts mean to society as a whole, not just the criminal system, but what it means for civil cases, what it means for um, people being able to, if, if you have a contract, being able to enforce your contract. So the Chief Justice met with the South Carolina Bar leadership and also the business community, and they understood the message, and they were able to put the message in a way to the legislators, legislators so that they could understand it and they could see the direct impact on their constituents. And part of the message was to get across to the legislature that the judiciary must be treated and funded as a branch of government and not an agency. And so often that's kind of what is viewed by the legislature and the executive branch, that we're just another agency and so you know you, you don't get any heightened level of treatment as far as your budget needs are concerned. But the South Carolina business community and the state bar lobbied the legislature to garner support for fee bills. And uh, without going into a lot of detail, because our funding situation in the state was so poor, the alternative that this community, this coalition came up with was to seek an increase in fees to help fund the court. And the, you know, it's not something that anybody really felt that they were pleased about doing it. One of the things I kind of knew that they kind of pinched their nose and voted for it in the legislature. But they got on board because they really understood that it was important that we have functioning courts. And they began, the legislature finally got the message that the courts are a core form of government, a core function of government, and it needed to be funded. The legislature passed this fee bill and made it through those, po those points. However, ultimately, the governor vetoed the, the bill. So, but while it was kind of a win-lose, win-lose win, we won in that the legislature got the message that really started lobbying for the courts. And we had people who were not attorneys, but regular legislators who understood how important courts are to the state and to the government, that they were rallying behind us and trying to figure out ways for us to be funded. And that fee bill, as I said, was something that no one really felt um, fondly of, but knew that it was essential given that we didn't have funds. After the governor, um, the governor vetoed the bill, the House and the Le House and Senate were not able to override the veto. But as a result, they proposed a new spending plan that cut more than $50 million from the general fund and redirected $23 million to the judicial department. So that's why I said it was a win-lose win, although it was not um, what ideally, you know, if we had gotten that in the beginning, we would have been happy. But it really, I think the fact that we've got everybody working with us for, towards um, trying to enact the fee bill, it garnered that kind of a level of support and they just felt that there was something that had to be done and had to find a way to make sure that we were adequately funded. As a result of that, we kind of, I guess the major points I would say are that judiciary must be funded as a branch of government and not as an agency because we're crucial to the public access to justice. And funding must be such that no two-tier systems of justice are imposed, meaning that while the, the fee bill would have been good, it would have sort of been a two-tier system. Those who were able to pay those fees to be able to have their day in court would be the ones who would be successful. But if you were not so fortunate, you might have a different level of justice, so to speak. And we also found legislators must understand the unique position of the court. And before that time, I don't know that it was really viewed by the legislature that courts were unique. As I said, we were viewed as an agency and not as a branch of government that really has a, our impact is felt to all levels of government, um, schools, criminal justice system, health care. I mean, we all have the courts, and we all know that the courts have an impact on every part of government, which is not, I think, the way the legislature used to look at it. But along with that, we found that partnerships must be established with a unified message regarding the importance of a well-functioning judicial system to our democracy and the need to maintain a stable court system. 
And that's where those coalitions come in that you've got to identify you need some other than the usual suspects, I guess, who go to the legislature telling your story. You need others who have respect. When I said that we had lobby, lobbyists from the business community and the bar, our, some of the, um, I don't want to get political, but a lot of the uh, lobbyists are really, some of the really most successful lobbyists have really good relationships with legislators. And I think that's probably true in most states. And because they supported our ideas, our vision, they were able to really tap into those relationships that they had with legislators, and they respected those lobbyists. So it was a, uh, a better way of getting the message across because you had, you had people who were trusted by the legislators and they had that relationship, and they were all telling them why courts are important to the um, state government. Let me talk a little bit about Florida, um, what, what was done in Florida. They really, do we have anybody in here from Florida? I don't have anyone who can kind of echo or tell, tell their side of how it happened. But in Florida, they looked at their internal partners and they developed the roles and responsibilities of those internal partners. They um, developed a budget request and, and had a substantive agenda. They identified key spokespersons to engage collaboratively in the advocacy, and then they developed the message that would be delivered so that they would speak with one voice. And that's another thing that's important. I know that I, a lot of places you're getting funding from local entities, so it may be that on the state level, the state funding, you have a unified voice, but in those areas where you have local areas um, and you're getting funding from your local governing bodies, then the individuals that are in that local governing body, I think these, these um, key, these, uh, I don't know what to call it, but anyway, I think that these things would apply to on a local level. Basically, that you need to have a vote, one voice. You need to decide what that message is and if you're um, consistent with it because it, there's nothing um, quicker to tear down your your advocacy if you're hearing different messages from different people and the legislators or your local governing bodies are not sure whose story to hear. So I would say that you've really got to develop a unified message. They also looked at their external partners, the Florida Bar, Justice Advocacy, advocacy Organization, Business Association, and they advised them, those groups, on what effective messaging would be. They prepared studies, reports, and support for adequate funding so that they could educate those external stakeholders on how to help deliver the message to the legislature and to the executive branch. Some of the things that Florida developed in their funding justice guide, they examined the strategies and the messages, they reviewed their best practices, they conducted focus groups, poll of voters, and interviews with chief justices, legislators, and others. They found that Government distrust tanks court. Only 13% of the public have a great deal of confidence in court. People demand belt tightening. The public is focused on other priorities. 17% feel states do not spend enough on court. And 17% is not a lot. I mean, we know that it should really be 100%. But that just tells you that the public's perception is they're not really concerned. Courts are seen as special but funding requests are viewed skeptically. Lawsuits, legal maneuvering, and inefficiency are blamed on court delays, so they don't look at, perhaps you don't have adequate funding to have an adequate number of resources to be able to provide the um, number of court hearings and, and to speed up the time for cases to be processed. In Florida, they tried to reach their policy makers to help them understand the budget process and to know budget leaders. You also have to build relationships year-round, not just when it's budget time. You have to pro respect the process and those who run it. Build credibility with budget staff, submit a credible budget request, and form broad co coalitions and enlist partners. Some of the trusted messengers that they found were Supreme Court justices, lawyer legislators, local judges and local lawyers, court users, business leaders, court staff armed with data and evidence. 
and under the court usage category, if you have businesses, families who have stories to tell about how the court system or the delay or you know how the court system has affected their lives and their things, those people to be involved in carrying a message to the legislature and to the executive branch are key and shouldn't be overlooked. We did a survey among, among the states to kind of see what messages resonated, um, what messages were delivered to help fund and um, to support new initiatives. And I'll just mention that what seemed to be the most effective was providing detailed stories involving real people who have suffered due to shortages in court resources. Also, another message that was effective was that courts are fiscally responsible and accountable for their performance, cutting waste and implementing efficiencies, saving money, and improving the delivery of justice. And that's kind of why I started out by telling you why it's important that we really have to evaluate what we're doing in our courts to make sure that we're allocating resources wisely, that we can show that we're being efficient with new technology, but it's expected in this day and age that we're not doing things the same way that we've done it in the past. So that's really a key in, in making it um, effective, delivering an effective message to get additional resources. I don't think the days are here where we are still here where you might be able to just present a budget and say, well, I need more money without being able to demonstrate that you're effectively using or efficiently using the funds that you've been provided or resources that you have. In Florida, they delivered the message through co coalitions and they presented a unified front to the legislature. They invited legislatures, excuse me, legislators to view the innovations that they had in the courts. And that's another key thing that I think in the state. If you're doing something within the court that you're very proud of and that you think would show or demonstrate how efficient you efficient you're operating, then those things need to be shared with the legislators. I think we often think that people know what we're doing in the courts and really unless you're at kind of directly involved, you probably are not really taking and paying a lot of attention to what goes on in the court system. So if you have innovations, I think those need to be shared with those policymakers who can affect your budget. Um, the messages were communicated in Florida through the media, through various legislative hearings, through yearly um, state of the judiciary address. But I think in all states, you can figure out different ways of getting that message across. But I think first, you've got to know what your message is, know who your messengers are, have those coalitions, but make sure they're educated on the message that they're delivering. And one of the things that in Florida I witnessed a, a demonstration of how they were able to get that message across, they actually kind of did some role playing and had training sessions around the state with various um, organizations, well not organizations, but courts. And in my state, we're a unified system and we're state funded, so I'm this is a little different to me, and I know a lot of states are decentralized and you get your funding from local governing bodies. So there's a need to make sure that this information is shared with the various groups. But in Florida, they met with different, um, the, the individuals who are going to be going to the legislature or the, the individuals who will be providing the funding to try to educate them on how to go to the legislators. And I can't go into it in a lot of detail, but basically they did role play to show what's not a good way to do it. For example, if you, you call up your legislator and you know it's in the, they're in the midst of um, some heated, controversial legislative debate, and you say, well, I need to meet with you, I need to talk to you about your budget. Of course, you probably get blown off and it's like, I don't have time for you. Um, so the better way of doing it without going into a lot of detail, you have to um, pick your time when to talk with them, not when you know that they're really distracted on other issues, but do it in such a way that you, you make it sure, make clear that you understand that they're working with very limited time and that you're not going to take up a lot of time, but you have a focused message. You only need so much of their time to talk about it. And also you need to have these relationships throughout the year, not just when you're going to ask for money or when you need something, but you need to be able to have a real relationship with those individuals who are going to be the policy makers or the ones who are going to provide your funding throughout the year so that when you go there with a need, it's an easy sell or at least you're much more likely to get an appointment so that you can talk to them. But again, it's got to be a focused message. And in delivering the message, 
you need to, as I said, talk with the guard, legislators, employees, public testimony before the legislature, TV, radio, press interviews. You got to get that word out. You got to get the message out because, as I said, we're focused on what's going on in the courts, but the general public is not. So you got to make sure that people understand what the problems are and how the lack of resources are affecting you and what the needs of the courts are. Um, local public outreach with legislators, our bar family representatives and judicial branch personnel, public outreach by the Supreme Court, the service organization, and to public sector. But the, the main point is that you've got to get the message out. You can't assume that people know what your problems are, what the needs are within the court. You've got to figure out a way within your area to determine how to um, get the message across. Another thing that they found was effective was to, in Florida, that is, is to use editorials in the state's largest circulation paper by both judges and by the editorial board focused on whatever that message is that you're trying to get out. Person-to-person -person communication with legislators, both at the leadership level, but also locally from judges and court administrators to local elected officials is effective. And as an organization, Justice for All, assisted with messaging as the state bar association. So really, you, you've got to, I guess, in every state, every local jurisdiction, you've got to build, build coalitions to help work with these assignments, okay? Um, again, working with groups, some of the groups you need to be sure you can include the executive branch, state and local bar association, criminal and civil justice partners, the business community, local government organizations, and civic and community organizations. And what we found is that nearly 30% of, of states have never had contact with the business community, local government organizations, or civic and other communities. So I think that's really kind of a change in how we function. But I want to leave you with some common mistakes. Don't use tales of woe about losing staff, salary increases, or courtrooms. And I know salary is a big issue or a big concern for judges, but that's not a winning argument a lot of times. You've got to figure out a different way to, to reach that discussion about salary increases. You have to assume the legislature understands, don't assume the legislature understands court functions and needs. Don't assert solely the third branch argument. You have to talk about the courts are not effective uh, alone, that you need to, that the courts are a core function of government. And don't leave out budget detail. But you do need to discuss unmet needs of businesses and individuals. You need to personalize the discussion. You do need to articulate these needs clearly and demonstrate them with data. Everybody now wants to back up. Why do you need to show us what you're doing and what you're going to do with what you get? And you must make a business case for budget issues using details and evidence. So I leave you with those as some, some things to think about and what other states have done to accomplish um, I've been more, be more successful in getting budget issues addressed. We have a, just a few more minutes. Um, if anyone has, does anyone have any questions? Just endorse one of the things that you said. We in New York have been successful recently. I don't know where to turn. Uh, to uh, increase the number of judges and some funding for those judges. And the way we were successful, we have been going every year with staff to the usual stuff and asking for money. Well, legislators hear that all the time. We came last year with groups, veterans groups, weekly groups, children's groups, police agencies, all the groups that are affected by a lack of resources and judges. And when you come to the legislators with all of those groups and put a face on the situation, it's far more persuasive and we were finally successful. Yes, exactly. I just, I, we have we have Bert Bramberg here from Justice at Stake. I think I'd, I'd like to hear how she was talking about you guys helped out in Florida. I know you've done other states uh, address the issues too. Thanks, and that was a terrific presentation. It was exciting to see because actually we, a couple of years ago, began working with the National Center for State Courts on um, a messaging project 
called Funding Justice. That was a, a national opinion survey of the public accompanied by focus groups. And then we also drilled down with separate interviews with uh, lawmakers and budgeteers and justices and everybody who was involved in the Supreme Court, excuse me, in court funding. And it's really heartening. Uh, and we distribute this to hopefully some of you got it and I know the court administrators got it. It's very heartening to see what's been happening because of it. A lot of it, what you described, is completely consistent with what's been going on and coalitions are very important. Um, the only thing I would add, because it's really all been said, and, and we have copies of the guide if anybody wants it, is to reinforce something you were saying, is that the lawmakers um, continue to be in a situation where even though things are recovering, it's still pretty tough and it's not an easy sell for anybody and every single person is coming back for more money. And embrace the idea that austerity is something that everybody is facing. Acknowledge that the court system, like every other um, um, person asking for money, has to tighten itself too. And when you make those explanations, it helps open minds. Uh, the lawmakers are hearing from everybody. Some of them may be outright hostile, but some of them are just hearing from everybody. And when you're the group that says, we get it, we're tightening our belts too, and here's specifics of why we need that more money, you seem to have more cut through. And then the final thing that sort of comes out here is that um, this really is all about lawmakers. We did extensive polling of the public, and while you can do some things to improve sympathy, there's not a core of the public out there waiting to be harvested to really build a big coalition. This is really an insider's game. This is not something where town meetings will suddenly get you more support by bringing in you know, room full of good people. And room full of that. I have the sense that you're more likely to get funding for a particular project or need as opposed to overall budget increases. And I, I, I'm speaking personally just from observation. I think that if you have a specific need, I think that legislators are, as was just said, there are so many demands on the funds that are available to the legislature. And, and I think we have sort of a, a new way of thinking that people want to sort of show me, sort of show me the money, show me why you need that. And if you're asking for just kind of a general broad increase, that's not as compelling. But if you can say, for example, with e-filing, they got it. Well, I'll use a more recent example in this last budget cycle. We're having the issue with not a shortage of court reporters, and we're trying to implement digital court reporting. And I was just amazed how quickly they got it. Even at our, our, at our first level at the subcommittee hearing, um, our subcommittee recommended funding $210,000 for us to begin the process. And we have another issue on off-site storage, of uh, security storage, and they got that issue. So we have other requests, but it really is more effective when you're talking about a specific need, and you can it resonates. They understand um, what that is. Then I think you're probably more successful. Any other questions, Tom? Or maybe one more question. joining us. We uh, really appreciate your time and, uh, and the wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we're going we're gonna to break and uh, hopefully you all are planning on going to the third installment of uh, the series um, of CLEs and that's in um, Sheridan Back Bay Ballroom, second level. Tomorrow morning's meeting is actually in the Heinz Convention Center at uh, 7.30. On the schedule it says 7.30, or was it a revised schedule that came out, I think? Yeah, it's seven, I, I, I was told 7.30. Huh? Oh, yeah, everyone's welcome. It, 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 you all can, everybody who's here today, we hope to see you all tomorrow. 7.30, um, Heinz Room, oh, is that Heinz Room or Heinz, it was the convention? Heinz, okay. 
uh, room 110 plaza level. So we'll see you all tomorrow morning, and I'm sure I'll see you around the meeting the rest of the day. Thank you. There is a sign-up sheet going around, and if you did not sign in, um, Denise has it. So make sure you sign in. Somebody from